compassion is for people who are suffering. Sympathy is for people who are suffering. Empathy is just stepping out of my point of view and stepping into your point of view. And I can do that with you if you're happy, if you're confused, if you're suffering, if you're not suffering. This is episode 033 with Karen Fates. What's going on everyone? Yell is here, founder of the IPS Project and your host on the show. I'm really glad to welcome you to another episode here on the IPS Podcast where you get the chance to learn lessons about life from a variety of different experts. Life lessons on the topics we learn little to nothing about growing up, topics in the categories of mental health, the mind, the body and brain, relationships and money. Now, in this episode, I had the pleasure of welcoming empathy trainer Karen Fate, founder of Others Unlimited. And yes, you heard that right, empathy trainer. There is often this myth that empathy is something that you either have or, or don't have. And while some people are naturally better at feeling empathy, it is, however, something that everyone can learn and become better at. And that is exactly what Karen Fate states and something that I personally agree with as well. Empathy is a practice, not just a feeling. You can get better at it by learning a set of skills and, and practicing them, which in truth is, well, that's very exciting, right? Because if you feel you're not so good at empathy, well, this might open a door that you thought was never even possible to enter. Now, before Karen started Others Unlimited, a professional training and coaching firm that provides empathy training to brands, teams, and individuals, she worked for more than 20 years as an ethnographer, where she conducted observational research for other companies. In the interview, Karen will talk a lot more about her work as an ethnographer and how she eventually started Others Unlimited to focus on empathy training. Now, some of the other things we will talk about are what unconditional welcome is, small and big things that people may think are helpful, but are actually standing in the way of creating a true connection with someone, a couple of exercises you can use to strengthen empathy, various other resources to help you learn more about empathy, the different kinds of empathy, and so much more. In the show notes located in the description of this episode, you can find all the resources mentioned by Karen in our conversation. Also, she recently did a TEDx talk titled How to Talk to the Worst Parts of Yourself, which received half a million views in just a period of uh, time. It's worth checking out. I truly thought it was a, an incredible talk. You can find the link to Karen's TEDx talk in the show notes together with ways to connect with her. If for whatever reason you can't find the show notes in the description, then you can also find them by going directly to dipsproject.com slash podcast and uh, searching for Karen. With that, please enjoy this interview about a topic we could all learn more about with Karen Fate, empathy trainer and founder of Others Unlimited. Karen. A warm welcome here to the IPS podcast. It's so good to finally talk to you. Thanks for having me. I've spent the last few days, um, you know, with quite a... I've spent a lot of time with you, actually, these last few days. And that will sound very weird. <laughs> but <laughs> I've listened to uh, quite some interviews of you. I've also watched your TEDx talk. Mm -hmm. which I can highly recommend everyone listening to check out. And I will also put it in the show notes. And just under like, I don't know, two months, it has got like half a million views, which is just, that's insane. That's incredible. How was it actually to do the TEDx talk? Oh, it was, I mean, it was a really, it was a really big night for sure. It was, um, the, the live event itself was, um, really beautiful and, um, in Kansas City, which is a place that I love and have a lot of, of friends and um, but also the other speakers were really wonderful. It was just a kind of beautiful moment of getting to share with a lot of other people who who were um, also really excited to be there. So it, was, it felt good. But what about like the half million views that watched your video? Like, <laughs> were you surprised? How does that feel? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. It is surprising because it's also not been 
it's not been like viral in that way where it's like suddenly a lot. It's just been steadily shared, you know, so that's really special too. And, and I mean, it's extremely heartening that my story was valuable to people and that they're sharing it with people and, um, and messaging me, which is, you know, always feels really, I'm honored that I've been able to be helpful. So, yeah, <laughs> again, everyone listening, it's really incredible TEDx talk, which, uh, yeah, you can find in the show notes. Now in some of the interviews and also in the TEDx talk, um, mm-hmm. you use the word unconditional welcome for those yeah. listening who might have no idea, like what it means, what is unconditional welcome? And like, what role does empathy play in being able to feel this unconditional welcome for someone? Yeah, great questions. So to answer about unconditional welcome, I may have to tell you a little bit about my, the early part of my career when I was working as an ethnographic researcher. And so my, um, I was an observational researcher. My job was to, to observe people in their lives and to get to know them as deeply as I could. And so, um, in order to do that as a researcher, you know, anything that I'm unwilling to see or accept in somebody is going to be a blind spot to me. It's going to be something that I don't understand or I can't glean insight from. So, you know, from a very basic, just rational point of view, I had to be willing to learn from somebody in order to actually research them. In order to get to know someone, I had to be willing to see them for all that they are and accept everything that I was seeing so that I could understand it and digest it and process it. And, and that practice, you know, someone once asked me if that was the same thing as radical acceptance, right? you know, um, which is another, a, a similar practice, but I don't think there's anything radical about it. In fact, I think it's pretty radical not to do it because, um, unconditional welcome is just about being aware of the moment and accepting the moment for what it is. Right. And for me, it's weirder to refuse to do that. So, so I think that, but, but we all do it all the time. There are lots of us that are kind of, you know, in our lives, there are either things about myself that I might not want to accept or things that I don't want to see in someone else. Um, so this, this experience is really special to just receive someone unconditionally. It's not quite as warm and cuddly as compassion. Um, and it's also not quite as cold and distant as neutrality. You know, it's something in between where I I just acknowledge and accept what is. Um, you know, I don't necessarily, you know, get involved or feel feel a lot of emotions about it. And I don't and I don't stay too distant that that it doesn't impact me at all. It's mm. a kind of in between those, in between those two. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like mindfulness in a way. Yeah. Just accepting the moment, how it is. Yeah. Then towards the person. Yeah. 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 One thing that's been really funny about the Ted talk is that a lot of people have recognized other systems of thought within the things that I've said, for example, um, internal family systems, which is a, it's a therapeutic approach, which involves, um, dialogue with all the parts of yourself. And it's extremely similar to some of the things that I was talking about. However, my approach didn't come from there, you know, that it came from another place. And I think that's, I think that's really interesting because the, the insight that we all contain multiple pieces, multiple parts of ourselves is a very old insight. You know, poets were talking about it thousands of years ago. There's, there's not, um, the, there, this therapy system, I, IFS is, is extremely useful and valuable Um, but what I'm talking about is not limited to psychiatry and it doesn't really have to do with therapy as much as it has to do with, um, I, I think for me, you know, just being more comfortable in my own mind and body and heart, because what, what this did practicing this with other people kind of helped me to practice it with myself as well. Right. Right. Is this like. Uh, the unconditional welcome did you hear it from someone or is this something that you well came those up two with? words i wrote to describe it when i started okay. to train young eth- ethnographers in the practice of observation i was trying right. to describe this thing that was not as cold as neutrality and not as warm as compassion and so i said i called it unconditional welcome um yeah. in order to describe it 
to my students. I love it. So you mentioned compassion. You have these words like empathy, compassion, sympathy. They're they're thrown out like very often like intertwined or like the, they're the same thing. Mm-hmm. What is the difference though between empathy, sympathy and compassion and why choose empathy over these other ones? Well, I'll tell you in short, empathy is the only one that doesn't require someone to be suffering. Um, compassion is for people who are suffering. Sympathy is for people who are suffering. Empathy is just stepping out of my point of view and stepping into your point of view. And I can do that with you if you're happy, if you're confused, if you're suffering, if you're not suffering. <clears throat> empathy is a cognitive practice of understanding. Now, there, there are actually a couple of different kinds of empathy, but the kind that I teach and practice is, um, is a cognitive practice. It's a skill. It's a perspective taking skill that allows me to understand where you're coming from and what your point of view is. And um, nobody has to be in pain for that to happen. And so that's, I think, for me, the primary difference. You also, you already like talked a little bit about it, or you mentioned a few, uh, a little bit about it, that you, you started as an ethnographer in ethnography, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm very curious to just ask like, how did you move from that to ultimately doing what you do today? You know, starting Others Unlimited, where you give them this uh, um, empathy training for brands, teams, and individuals. Mm -hmm. How did you move from that area to this area? Yeah, how did this start? Well, it started when I started to train young ethnographers. I had, you know, when I, my first intern, whom I love, because he kind of forced me to develop this curriculum. My first intern, um, you know, funny enough, he struggled with um, ADHD, an attention deficit Mm -hmm. um, issue. And as you can imagine, a person with ADHD is particularly challenged to practice something like quiet observation, you know, quietly observing someone else um, was not very intuitive for him. You know, he had, he had a very, he was very chatty and very, you know, kind of um, active and getting him to slow down and just see what I had to give him really specific steps for how to listen to someone carefully and how to observe their body language. And, and so I developed a, a kind of training program for him over the course of his internship, which was just an eight week summer session. And, um, and I started to use it. The tools that we developed together, I started to use to share with other people. So it was actually when I was <clears throat> working in an advertising agency some years later that I offered um, a course on deep listening for employees inside of the company. And that um, was received really well. And folks started to tell me, you know, this isn't just use- useful for listening to customers or listening to my colleagues. This is also useful in my marriage or this is useful Mm -hmm. you know in my family and and so it began to take shape as really an empathy training course rather than an ethnographic research training course and um yeah and it was just i kind of just it was a very very smooth transition i should have actually asked this maybe before that question that i asked but could you maybe also explain what uh, and ethnography is and, and yeah. you know, the profession, what it actually is about. Yeah. Because I've, well, <laughs> I, for example, never heard of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm also, I don't speak English. I mean, like my native language is not English. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, probably translated. I might have heard about it. But yes. Well, ethnography, I mean, the roots, ethno and graphy, it just means a study of culture. And, um and so some, when they hear the word, they kind of think of more of a, a sociology kind of perspective or even, and many people would even imagine um, conducting research in a foreign country or, you know, outside in, in outside of your own world. The ethnography that I practiced was very much inside of the world that I live in. Um, however, the cultures were specific usually to um, brands. So, you know, my first job as an ethnographer, I was working for the client was a furniture designer who wanted to know um, what kinds of 
furniture that office workers needed to do their different kinds of jobs. So the culture that I was studying was office culture. And, and I was observing the way that people moved through spaces and people use objects and how you know, their, their office environment impacted their communication and their culture and, and their collaboration. And so that was a very specific culture study there, you know, of course, I've done other work with other brands, even with, you know, fast food brands where the culture that I'm studying is, you know, even like teenagers eating chicken wings or whatever it might be. There are, when I was doing this work for advertising, it was a study of culture. Now, what's different about ethnography versus other kinds of market research is that ethnography is um, a fully immersive, qualitative style of research that um, I'm not sending people surveys or bringing people into a research facility and like doing focus mm. groups or this kind of thing. I'm actually going into their homes. I'm following them to work. I'm, you know, riding on the bus or the train with them and and really shadowing them in their lives as they do the things that they do in order to kind of see it and feel it as closely as I can. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that is... That's a super special thing about ethnography. It also means that it can't be done quickly. It's very difficult to do at scale. Um, it is, It is. so I'm usually working with a very small number of, of research subjects, but I'm spending a lot of time with them to understand them very, very well. So um, that's the difference between ethnography and other, other market research. Very interesting job, actually. Yeah, it's cool. And then because of this intern, and the curriculum that you created for him, that's been sort of the bridge to go towards doing his trainings in empathy. Yeah, Darren is his name and he's the best. But he uh I, I tell him all the time he's responsible for the for the foundation of my company. Um <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it was really, really wonderful to do that with him. When you tell people that this is what you do professionally, that you professionally train people on empathy. What are actually some of the responses that you get from people? Everyone I have ever told tells me immediately that they need it and the world needs it. That is, mm. um, I have never I heard agree. from anyone that they don't think it's valuable. <laughs> Everyone says, <laughs> oh, wow, we need more of that. We need more, we need more people teaching empathy. Um, yeah. And so that's, but yeah, it's a conversation starter for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have a lot of people with that kind of job uh, title or, or description, right? Yeah, I believe uh, very I, I mean, cool. we just got our trademark. Um, and wow. so I, I believe we are actually the first trademarked empathy training organization. That's amazing. Congrats. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I actually, well, I read on the websites of Others Unlimited that empathy is a practice, not a feeling. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, personally, I agree with that, mm -hmm. but I'm, I could assume that some people listening when I just say, say that mm -hmm. might not agree with it or might not be sure like how you even practice it. How have you come to, how have you come to the realization that empathy indeed is a practice and not a feeling? And then another question <laughs> attached to this one. Um, and how have you seen people, you know, who took such a training with you also come to re realize this? Yeah. Well, I should clarify, first of all, that there are three different kinds of empathy. Um, effective empathy, somatic empathy, and cognitive empathy. Effective empathy is that feeling, emotional kind of empathy that's caring about someone. It's kind of the way that most of us were taught, this sort of golden rule kind the of empathy. emotional caring, caring about your experience and trying to understand you. Um, that's a kind of emotional kind of empathy, affective empathy. Somatic empathy is a physically embodied experience of actually physically feeling your pain. And um, I, I like to call that one sci-fi empathy because, <laughs> because you often see it in like the X-Files or whatever, that someone would be able to feel the pain of other people. And right. That does exist. It's rare, but maybe you've heard about, you know, spouses who have like sympathy pains when their spouse is in labor or, um, or even, um, you know, other people who are kind of taking on the experience or the energy of others. So this is, this is a, it's a real thing. 
it is hard to teach. Um, and I don't know how useful it is for most of the work that I am teaching people to do. Um, you know, if I were feeling everything that my research subjects were feeling, I may in many cases be debilitated. And so it's important for me to have some kind of distance from their experience. Yeah. Now, cognitive empathy is the kind that I practice and teach. And cognitive empathy is a, a mental practice of, of research and learning and being curious about another person's point of view and trying it on intellectually, trying it on, um, you know, examining it, exploring how this idea works or how that feeling works or what is this, where does this point of view come from? Really understanding that other person's point of view. There's a, um, in, uh, in like debate skills, there's a, there's a kind of principle that you should be able to articulate your opponent's argument as well or better than they can. This is an empathy practice, right? So it's like cognitive empathy is about, you know, am I able to articulate your point of view as well or better than, than you can? And that practice, um, when we do it well, when we practice unconditional welcome, it does usually have the side effect of caring, of, mm. of really feeling for someone else. It doesn't always, you know, I, I will say that I, um, I got hooked on some Netflix series a couple of years ago about, about, you know, the serial killer, Ted Bundy, who was just a monster, absolute monster. Right. Yeah, but yeah, when yeah, I watched yeah. this series, yeah. I did start to understand him more. I started to understand kind of how his mind worked a little bit more and, you know, what some of his what his life was like or what his experiences were like. Um, it did not make me any more compassionate toward him. You know, understanding him in that case did not result in my feeling compassion or sympathy or any desire for, you know, an empathic resonance. But I did do the practice of shifting my perspective and imagining what this other, this very, very different kind of mind was like. And, you know, it was pretty horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, trying to understand someone doesn't mean that you have to agree with what they did, right? Absolutely. But at least it can help you see why they did those things. Yeah. And even with someone like that, which is horrible what that person has done, but there are reasons why that person has done this, right? Yeah. And for that person, the, those were well, good reasons, but just trying to understand it. Yeah. Again, doesn't mean that you agree with it. Just removing the judgment from it so that you can, so that you can understand it. Because I mean, there, and there's a lot that, especially in the case of him, there is a lot about his story, which I would like to reject. I would not like to, there are lots of parts of it that I don't want to know about and, and that are hard to imagine um, really, really painful to imagine. Uh, so it's, you know, I have to kind of practice some kind of objectivity or non-judgment in order to mm. even begin to understand. And, um, and of course, you know, that's much easier with people who are not serial killers. <laughs> like and most, most of people, us right? aren't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> most of us aren't. So it's really, you know, it's doable. Yeah. <laughs> So if we would actually, you know, go practical, um, well, first of all, I actually do want to ask what would be like the fundamental ingredients that make empathy, that allow you to feel like you're talking to an empathic person? And mm -hmm. I could assume that like actively listening, feeling that someone is actively listening would be one of those main ingredients. But what are the other ones? Yes. So there are three. And it's um, okay. intention, attention, and non-judgment. So I need to mm. intend to understand you. Mm -hmm. This is not something that happens automatically for anyone. I mean, someone may argue with me about that. I would be happy to argue with them about that. All of us, everything... Everything that I see is coming through my eyes. Everything that I hear is coming through my ears. You know, everything is processed through my mind and my body. So my default mode is always going to be self-centered. 
and there, and I don't judge. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's a, it's a normal state of being. It's a common state of being that everything that I'm experiencing and everything that I'm expressing is centered in, I am the center of it. And that's okay. Sure. That's okay. But in order for me to understand you, I have to intentionally step outside of that. I have to intend to, or it will not happen. If mm. I don't, if I assume that I'm just an empathetic person, I'm probably lying to myself because you have to really intend to practice. Um, the sec second is attention. So, and they, intention and attention go together, but attention is, is about being very present with someone and it's like about actively um, listening. Yeah. I mean, actively listening, but also just, um, noticing, being curious, mm. being, um, you know, when you're observing, you're kind of investigating in a way that has your attention, you know, and that attention is really important. And then non-judgment is really, um, the practice of unconditional welcome. Non-judgment is about, and non-judgment is actually sometimes pretty difficult because yep. most of us believe in um, some kind of idea of good and bad, right? Most of us do. Some people don't. Um, and I think I probably do too, but I, it's not helpful. It's not helpful when I'm, when I'm trying to empathize with someone instead of thinking of their behavior or their mannerisms or their personality in terms of good qualities and bad qualities, I have to let go of that and receive everything. And so without having favorites, without having favorite characteristics. So, so non-judgment is about um, seeing things as they are without placing any kind of moral or ethical or even, you know, value-based judgment on, mm on not evaluating them. You're just allowing, allowing them to be there. And yeah, it's, the um, it's welcome. fun. Say that again. Yeah. The unconditional welcome. Yeah. Unconditional welcome. Yeah. It's fun um, when, when people challenge it because it's, um, yeah. And, and everybody challenges it a lot. You know, it's so easy to just, you know, encounter someone who seems to be in the wrong or being very rude or something like this and just and to imagine you know oh that person is the asshole in this situation well you don't know you know you don't you don't know what's going on um entirely inside or outside of that person and and so it's you know that that stepping aside stepping away from the judgment and yeah. just letting yourself be curious about yeah. another experience you know funny i'll share kind of vulnerably about 15 years ago i stopped taking a psychiatric medicine that a medication that i'd been taking for some years and I, I weaned off of it as the doctor told me to but still when i stopped taking it completely i had an extreme withdrawal symptom which was that i was very like extremely emotionally reactive um, in a way that I'd never seen in myself before. I had a super short temper. I got really angry or I would cry super suddenly. I mean, I'm normally kind of a crier, but I, it was very pronounced. And I remember, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember this time that it, for a couple of weeks, it was like this. I mean, it was really, I had some other symptoms too, but it was, it was really, really um, strange for me. And then I, something mm. happened. I don't remember what it was, but I, I snapped at someone on a public bus. And, and I immediately cried because I couldn't believe I had done that. You know, it was just right. so unlike me. And, mm. and I felt out of control of myself. And I found myself saying to this person, I'm so sorry, that's not really me. And then I thought, well, who is really me? Because I definitely did that. And then I realized that my brain chemistry had changed so much that I didn't recognize myself, but then I also recognized that um, it's, I'm like, what if it's possible that everyone in the whole world who has snapped at me or who thought, or who I thought was rude, just has different brain chemistry than I do. And I think, I think it's rude, but maybe they don't have the ability to control this chemical response. And it gave me this, like, I had this mesmerizing moment of empathy and realizing that the people who I was most sure were jerks 
might just have different brains. And that was like, that opened a whole new um, kind of area of questioning for me and recognizing neurodiversity and recognizing that, you know, a lot of people have different brain chemistry. Some people have a very difficult time accessing emotions at all. That's another reason why I practice cognitive empathy, because it, a lot of people who don't necessarily feel very open emotionally, sometimes feel like they don't have empathy or they're not capable of empathy or people have right. told yeah. them that they aren't empathetic. And I like yeah. to encourage those people because you don't have to feel emotions to practice empathy. You can be curious and you can examine and explore the perspective of someone else without having any feelings about it at all. And so that's, that's you know, so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, could you and if you, uh, I didn't want to interrupt. No, you. Go on. Uh, but that's amazing, right? For some people to hear right now, because they're like, ah, People have told me that I uh, just am not good at it. I will never be good at it. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that it is truly a practice mm -hmm. and not a feeling, as stated on Others Unlimited, that you said, that opens this whole door to actually yeah. connect more with someone. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for sharing, of course, your experience and being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really good to always check in, right? Because you never know what someone is going through. You know, you can't see what someone is dealing with inside and why they might react in a way that they did react, but there's always reasons. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so it was um, non-judgment, intention and attention, right? Mm -hmm. I got the order right. probably wrong, but those there's were no the order. three. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Three. What would be an exercise that listeners right now um, could do at home to practice one of those three things or all three of them that you teach during such um, trainings on empathy? Well, I mean, the I think you, you called it earlier, which is mindfulness practice. So one really simple exercise that we could even do right now is that I like to practice listening just to the room and see how many sounds you can identify. For example, um, I, ha I can hear cars going by my house and there's been a little bit of rain. So there's this, that really like sweepy sound of the wheels on the shallow water. And I can hear my heater. And more traffic. So can you identify any sounds from where you are? I can also hear cars. Uh huh. And I hear something in my microphone. Uh huh. Like some kind of like a noise cancellation thing going there. Mainly those two, I would say, at the moment. So, um, this is actually a really wonderful exercise to do in a public place because there are very often many, many, many different layers of sound. And you can yeah. see how many you can follow at the same time because you might hear people, you might hear traffic, you might hear air conditioning or noises, uh, birds or pet sounds or whatever they are. And, and so that is an intentional practice of attention. And then the, the third layer is that we want to notice which of the sounds we like and which sounds we don't like and then remove okay. the judgment. You know, it's like, mm. do I prefer some of these sounds? Some of it sounds like noise to me. Some of it sounds beautiful to me. What is that? Why? Right. What's that judgment? And so um, I was actually taught this um, in music school uh, when a, a teacher of mine, when we were in ear training, a teacher of mine would take us in into a public space and we would sit and see how many sounds we could track and practice, you know, wow. zooming in with our attention and intention and then removing the judgment and just receiving and trying to have the same relationship to any of those sounds, no matter how pleasant or unpleasant they are. That's a beautiful practice, actually. And yes. funny enough, I, well, I came back recently from a monastery where I was like 10 days. Mm -hmm. And during the meditation, this was also something that they asked us to focus on, like during meditation, just like notice all the sounds. You know, mm -hmm. and don't judge them. Just let them be there. Mm -hmm. 
and uh yeah it's a very i don't know I, I like it a lot i like it a lot to just pay attention to so many more sa- there's so many more sounds around you that you just don't notice if you don't try to pay attention yeah. to them and uh you know non-judgment is really um fun and funny and deep too because you know when you find yourself judging some of the sounds or preferring them you you shouldn't judge that either you know so you can like notice that you're judging it and let it be without kind of forcing yourself to because that's what part of it too is to say oh shit i'm judging it i'm not supposed to be judging it i'm doing a bad job of this and then you're judging yourself you know what i mean yeah. so it's kind of a all right <laughs> i'm i was judging that sound interesting so yeah. you know that's kind of one of the and it's one of the tools that i teach when when we're encountering someone else that you know instead of meeting someone with a no you meet with an oh you know to just be curious mm. and to say huh that's something i didn't know before thanks for that new piece of information instead of you know rejecting or reacting to it okay that's a very cool practice actually mm-hmm. is there another one that you would like to share if you co- if there's another one that comes to your mind and it is actually doable right now to teach right Well, I can tell you um one of them that I do and this has to do with intention and attention, but it's it's um because we can do it right now. You do do it with yourself. I'm going to sit differently so I can do it, but I like to sit and and let my arms hang by my sides. This okay. is a meditation technique that I learned many years ago, but I find mm-hmm. it very accessible, so I I often teach this in workshops. and just bring your awareness to the tip of the index finger of your right hand just focus all your awareness on just that point and see if you can feel your heartbeat there mm. got it yeah and now move yeah. to the tip of the middle finger of the right hand until you can feel your heartbeat there Sure. And now the ring finger. Mm. It goes faster now, right? And now your pinky. Yeah. And now the thumb. Yeah. So now all five fingertips, you can feel the heartbeat. Yeah. And now you'll notice if you go to the left, it's going to be even faster. Mm. Now you can imagine the sensation in the toes it's harder to feel in the toes but you can imagine it there the same heartbeat it's getting all the way down there you may not be able to feel it as physically but you can imagine mm-hmm. it yeah mm-hmm. and and the face and now you just kind of imagine every square inch of your skin with this same pulse This is physically coming from your heart. But it's also energetically this is the vibration of your life force, right? Mm. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you can take it as deep as you want to take it. It could just be a physical practice, but you can also really imagine yourself filled with this life. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And so how do you feel now? I feel peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like okay. when I do this practice, I feel uh-huh. like I'm I'm totally inhabiting my body. You know? Sure, I I, I I can definitely feel myself being very aware of many parts of my body actually, yes. Yeah, much more so. So before we did this, I was sitting with my legs crossed and I was kind of detached from the rest of my body. Now I feel I feel my whole body yeah. now. I feel like I'm in yeah. my whole body. And so um and when you practice this, you can you can do it very quickly. And so it is like this is the practice that I do, you know, right before I have an interview or right before I, you know, if I'm uh-huh. if I'm going in to observe someone and I and I forgot, you know, I'll do it real quick on the elevator before I get there because you can really just bring yourself all the way into your body yeah. and be aware. So this is a it's an intention and attention practice of just being fully mm-hmm. in this human container. <laughs> yeah. And how does this translate to empathy 
with people. Yeah, well, it's part of it's part of being uh, attentive of the moment. Yes. So yeah. when I when I practice noticing myself, it's also another part of empathy practice, which is super important, is something that I call self witnessing, and that is just it's self awareness, self knowledge. It's knowing because. As a researcher, you know, we, for science reasons, try to be neutral, but there's no neutrality because I'm impacting everyone that I'm observing because they can see me and I look like this and I sound like this and I act like this. And so I need to know how I impact other people so that I can kind of make some adjustment for that. You know, um, when I was working as a researcher, for example, if I was going to observe someone in an office or in their home, I would always make sure that I would, I was wearing quiet shoes. You know, I would never wear heels or, or hard soled shoes because I don't want them to notice me very much, you know, and I would try to just uh, dress whatever way they dress in that office or in that place. So I would try to blend in, but still there are many places that I just don't blend in. And there are many cultures that, I'm still going to stick out like a sore thumb or some people are going to respond to me with a strong response. And um, I mean, more could be said about that in terms of research, but it's important for me to know, like I know that I love to talk. I mean, it's hilarious because I teach listening, but I will talk all day long if you let me. I love to talk. And so it's something I know about myself and it's something that I know about myself so I can kind of adjust for that and I can restrain myself sometimes. And I know that like, this is my nature is to be really chatty. So I need to make sure that I let other people talk. Sometimes I need to make sure to ask questions instead of just sharing my thoughts. And, um, and that's, you know, a self-awareness practice, but getting to know myself and my body, for example, when I do this exercise of checking in with my heartbeat, um, I also notice right away, if it's really difficult for me, I might, become aware that I'm feeling disconnected from my body, or I might be very anxious, or I might, you know, if my energy is, if it's really hard for me to ground myself that way, then I might know that I'm a little imbalanced in one way or another. And that's good information for me. So when I encounter someone else who is stressed or angry or having some strong experience and I'm, and I'm reacting to that experience, I can be aware, remember? You were stressed out before you even got here. This doesn't have to do with them. It has to do with you, you know? And so that's mm. helps in, in, in relationships, knowing how I'm doing before I'm engaging with someone else and before I'm kind of projecting my experience onto them. It's helpful. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense actually. Yes. Well, thank you for, for sharing those practices. There is, um, a very beautiful video on YouTube from Brene Brown called mm -hmm. Empathy. Mm -hmm. If you watched, I don't know if you've watched oh, yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. Uh, I will also link it up in the show notes for people to check out because it's it's really, it's a short video with beautiful animations and the message is just, it's, it's a beautiful message. Um, to quote Brene Brown from out of that video, rarely does an empathic response begin with at least mm -hmm. and this is very true, right? Uh, and she gave a couple of examples of like, oh, well, um, uh, Sophie is struggling in school. Well, at least John is doing good. Mm -hmm. Oh, I uh, just got divorced. Well, at least you still have a house. Mm -hmm. You know, I and I've experienced this actually in the last two years a lot that people used at least. So... Uh, I survived a, a sudden cardiac arrest two years ago, mm. and I've heard so many people tell me, well, at least you're still alive. Yeah. While I was trying to talk about, because there's a cost to surviving it, you know, sure. there's been some complications with my heart because of this. And when I was trying to share that, people were always going like, oh, well, but at least you're still alive. And that is true, and I'm grateful for that. But when you do that, when you say that, you you fail to connect with that per person, right? Because you're not listening to what they're actually trying to say. Mm -hmm. The question that I have is, what are some other small or big things that you noticed people do that they think is helpful, 
but in reality are actually rather standing in the way to uh, create a true empathic conversation? Um, well, the first one, which I kind of touched on earlier, is to say, I know, or me too. Right. People, yeah. people think that it means I'm empathizing. I'm telling you, oh, I know. I know how that feels. I've been there. That happened to me. Me too. Um, it's not that that's a bad thing to say, but before you say that, ask more questions. You know, be more curious. So I have a tool um, where first you zoom in. Give me more detail. Can you be specific? Then you zoom out. Tell me more. What else is going on? So get more detail, then get more context. And then um, echo what you've heard. Like, oh, it sounds like what you're feeling is this. And then appreciate it. Thank you so much for telling me that. Mm. And then you respond, whether maybe there's an action that's necessary, or you can just say, I'm going to give this some thought or ask, like, what would you, how can I help? Um, or, you know, what, what needs to happen now? And this is, this is a, a way of engaging with someone empathically with curiosity and maybe if necessary with compassion. But even if what you're getting from that person is something really negative, this is like this, this, um, framework that I just shared with you is actually a way to respond to people giving you feedback. Like if someone comes to me and says, oh, I gotta I tell you, I gotta tell you, you hurt my feelings. And I say, okay, tell me specifically what happened and then tell me more. What else was going on? Okay. It sounds like you're saying this. Thank you for telling me. I'm going to give this some thought, you know, and instead of just reacting emotionally, like, no, I didn't, or yes, I did, or, oh, yeah, well, you also, you know, like this kind of, <laughs> it's like, you know, just first get some more information, yeah, take it in, thank right. the person for giving it to you. And the thing is, um, I do this with myself, you know, when mm -hmm. I have, I still have this part of myself that'll tell me, like, even right now, I've had this on the call that someone up here is telling me, um, I'm not doing a good job of being interviewed by you. And this is not an interesting podcast and I'm not saying anything interesting. And, and, and so I'm just like, okay, can you be specific? Oh, okay. You didn't like that. I said that and it's like, all right, well, in the grand scheme of things, do you think really I'm doing a terrible job? You know, then we have a dialogue and I'm like, all right, well, it sounds like you're feeling like unprepared and overwhelmed about some other things. Thanks for letting me know. I am going to, give you some attention later, but I need you to let me be on the podcast right now. So this is like an internal thing that's happening in the background of my mind while I'm talking to you. So this is a, you know, it's just a framework for just engaging with other people and, and other parts of yourself. Before we continue with the interview, I just like to take a moment to mention if you feel that you've gained some insights and lessons from this interview and you're curious to see what else we offer at the IPS project, I recommend that you check out the IPS Academy where we offer online courses taught by guests here on the IPS podcast. Learn more about essential life topics such as mental health, relationships, the mind and the body and brain through fun and interactive courses. Simply go to dipsproject.com slash academy or check the description of this episode to find the link. Each course has a few lessons to try for free, so you can get a taste of what the course is like. We have countless reviews from other students, so you can see what others think. And there is a 30-day money-back guarantee if you end up not liking the course. Having said that, let's return back to the interview. When you do these trainings on empathy, do you actually notice like a difference between men and women on how you know they show empathy and maybe also like what they might struggle with but also what they might learn from each other it's a very interesting question well i'll have to say that i've i have consistently been very surprised at how open men are to it you know, I think that I assume, I have often assumed, particularly when I've done these workshops in, you know, a room full of executives that are mostly male, 
Yeah. I've assumed that they may not be that interested in it. Like my inner critic is telling me they don't give a shit about this. Talk about something that's more practical, you know? Um, well, first of all, empathy is very practical, but, um, but yeah, I've, I've often been surprised at how, how open they are and how grateful they are to have an experience of connection with someone and to be, to be allowed to talk about how they're feeling and what they're struggling with, because especially, well, especially in the case of executives, they often don't have people that they can really share their challenges with because everyone's looking to them for leadership. And, and so, um, so I, I've often been surprised at how much men have, have really craved that experience of connection and, and feeling with each other. Um, I think mm -hmm. that women, you know, and, and I, I just want to say, uh, women and men are, women are not all the same and men are not all the same. And so sure. I, I, I can't, I, 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 I hate making generalizations like right. that. But I didn't I want to ask this to make exactly like, uh, that yeah. every, every man or women is like that. Right. But just like yeah. something that you might've noticed. More Absolutely. Yeah. I just, what I've noticed is my biases were wrong. Um, okay. you know, when I assumed that men would not be interested or open, That's I was good. wrong. And, um, there's a, I think women sometimes, uh, I hate, I hate saying things about all women. I'm not saying it about all women, but I've noticed that sometimes I think women sh struggle to, uh, maintain curiosity before jumping immediately into sympathy, you know? So it's like some people, they're going to hear what's going on with you and they immediately want to give you sympathy and compassion instead of like, mm. it's like, wait, wait, wait. Be curious, ask more questions first, make sure mm. that you understand what this is before you immediately go into compassion mode and, yeah. you know, let compassion be the result of true understanding instead of just like, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a very kind impulse to, you know, take care of someone else. Um, that not all women have. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And <laughs> again, for everyone listening, we are certainly not talking about all women, all men, right? We are but not. again, about your experiencing, uh, your experience of, of what you've noticed. Um, yeah. Do you also, is there also something coming to your mind when I asked, like, um, what could they learn from each other about empathy? Well, I, you know, I always encourage people to, um, I think what they could learn from each other is to learn from each other. Because you know, just like I was surprised by what I saw in the men that I worked with. I think that men and women, I think men and women too often assume things about one another. And when we really practice empathy, we get to break those things apart. You know, um, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, when men, when men and women are practicing empathy for one another, uh, to practice that non-judgment, which also means refraining from positive judgment. You know, don't assume that person is naturally empathetic or that person is um, in, a, in a better place than you think they are or is a good leader or is a good mother or whatever it is, that's also a judgment. So it's like, just maintain the curiosity. Let yourself be surprised by someone. Like expect to be amazed. This is a, um, I think it's a quote by Bill Nye, actually. Bill Nye says, everyone you will ever meet knows something that you don't. And so yes. this is a... Great quote. It's so good. And it's, and it's you know, men and women, we're all so different. And, and it's, if we can maintain that curiosity, I, I don't think we got to give them any more direction than that. I agree. Yeah. Karen, I just have a few last questions left for you for those listening who want to dive even deeper uh into empathy and learn even more about it what are some of the best resources that you have discovered any books or any podcast episodes or any videos like the one that i shared from Brené brown for example that you often recommend to people and where you also learned a lot from on the topic again of empathy. Yeah, I have a really good one. And uh, folkstreams.net slash films. This is a collection of 
ethnographic documentaries of cultures all over the world. And you can just dig in. I mean, some of them are really short. Some of them are super low budget. Some of them are really old, but it's just really specific, beautiful cultures that you can just learn about, about people that are completely different from you. And it's so interesting to just browse, you know, all these different, um, all these different people all over the world uh. and, to, you know, get to know, yeah, get to know people different from yourself. I love it. It's a great place to just go and watch. So another one is um, anth101.com. So this is anthropology um, for civilians. And there's, so <laughs> I just sent you a link to anth101.com, 10 challenges. And this is like 10 yeah. little homework assignments oh, cool. that regular people can do to just learn more about other people. And it's really fun. Thank you for sharing. And I will link it up in the show notes for everyone uh, listening. Uh, I will also take a look actually at both of them uh, after the interview, of course. I um, I want to end the interview by <laughs> asking you actually a very personal question and let okay. me know if it's too personal. Okay. Uh, so yeah, if it's too personal, just tell me and we, we don't have to dig into it. But I heard you mention in another interview that you struggle with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And is it something that you still struggle with or sure. something that you struggled with? Well, I struggle differently than I struggled in the past, <laughs> but sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a diagnosis that I have. Um, complex post-traumatic stress is, uh, I mean, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it's, it's often the result of, of sustained trauma over a long period of time. And, um, and it's been something that I've lived with for most of my life. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, I don't know what you went through, of course, right? But it must have been very, yeah, a, a bunch of, of traumatic experiences, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm very sorry, of course, for what you went through. I'm not um, sorry. Let me tell you something. This is very interesting. I don't want to tell you what I went through, not because it's too horrible to tell you, but because mm -hmm. one thing that's helped me very much is not to regard those things as bad things about my life. And that that's good. Everything that I went through in my early life gave me so many incredible gifts and made me curious and allowed me to have this kind of to create this kind of investigation of, of what it means to be a person and what it means to feel and what it means to be in pain. And I'm not sorry about any of it. And I also feel like, you know, that I, you know, that compassionate kind of response to, to a diagnosis, um, you know, I receive that compassion and I'm grateful for it, but I also really don't, I don't feel sad about it at all. You know, it's, it's, it's a, and I'm grateful for that, but I've also worked very hard for it. <laughs> I've worked very hard to not be sad about it anymore. But that's, I mean the best approach in a way to look at it right to not be the victim but actually try to see the lessons in it and try to be a better version of yourself right uh which does not mean that the things that you went through were not terrible right yeah <laughs> but i mean the way that you look at it is really positive actually yeah it's um yeah i think that it's well, it, it's difficult to talk about without seeming like I'm dismissing it. And I, and I don't want to dismiss it, but I also, because of this practice of non-judgment, um, I do try to refrain from calling it terrible. I think it was a very intense experience. It was a really unusual experience, not as unusual as people think, but <laughs> it's actually pretty common, but, um, but it was a it was a very painful experience, but and in many ways an un, unjust experience. Um, but I just wouldn't call it terrible, because okay. I I also feel like it's very deeply for me very deeply connected to 
you know, my reason for being in the world. And I think that, you know, I do kind of personally believe that I came here with a purpose and that I got to work right away, which involved going through some painful things. But um, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Mm. Well, if if you can get a meaning out of it, yeah, the story can become very different, right? Yeah, yeah. From ah, this has important. befallen on me to okay, this is something you know that I can better the world and myself actually with. Yeah. I was curious, and can I ask actually a question about uh, about your experience? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Is there like a moment that you can recall when you shared parts of what went, what happened in your past, you know, to someone where you hoped that you were about that, that you hoped to get an empathic response from, but yeah. actually that person, <laughs> okay, yeah. well, yeah, and a person actually didn't. Yeah. Um, and I was curious to ask, like, what could have that person done that would have made you feel understood? Well, I'm going to, I know where, what you're getting at and I, I'm not sure the response that I have for you is what you want, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because I think it's really interesting. When I was uh, a teenager in music school, I had, um, I had a music teacher, a Russian man who was um, very much a Russian man. Um, and he, um, he was really hard on me. He was very, he was very strict. And, um, and one time I was, you know, I was really going through a lot. And, and so I kind of, I thought, oh, I'll tell him what I'm going through and then he'll understand, you know, and he'll have compassion for me if I tell him this horrible story. And I told him what was going on. And I told him um, what I thought was a, a, a story of something terrible that happened to me. And he said, do you think you're the only one who has pain? Oof. <laughs> and he was just like, what do you think this only happened to you? It's like, look around. Everyone in the world is suffering. And I was at the time like really devastated because it mm. seemed so cold to me, what he said. But I wanna tell you that um, he was right. Not that he was right to respond that way, but when I've, I've thought of that moment so many times, and it is so helpful for me to recognize that everyone in the world goes through really painful stuff. Some stuff, some of the stories are more dramatic and cinematic than others, but everyone, experiences pain everyone experiences loss everyone is devastated sooner or later it's the experience of being a person and and he just he was just like if you're in pain use it i want to hear it in the music i don't want to hear it in your story and and so he made me play you know and i had to and and it was he taught me to transform that pain into creating something beautiful now he did it in a way that felt cold and mean but that was just because I was a kid and I didn't really, I didn't have that deep of an understanding of things yet. But now, um, now that I do, I think that that was an extraordinary lesson to be able to transform my pain into the music instead of using it as an excuse not to practice. You know? Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, do I think that that's how you should talk to a 15 year old who's suffering? No, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, like, but, but, um, yeah, I think that the fact is that when horrible things happen, there is no right way to respond to them. There's nothing you can say. And and there's so many things that seem like the right things that could still hurt that person anyway. And so I think that in those moments, we just need to remain curious and open and 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 soft, you know, to let... You know, this it's funny because I wanted to tell you this earlier and it didn't, I, I think it, it wasn't sure it was quite right, but another tool that I often share with people 
is how to receive imperfect communications because we are all imperfect with one another. Because I could, yeah. I could give you, you know, here are the three tips for how to respond to someone who's going through a hard time in an empathic way, but it's bullshit because there's no formula that works for everyone all the time. You know, when, right. when, yeah. when really tragic, really awful, abusive, horrible things happen, there isn't a kind of, oh, just do this and then this and then this, and then like, you did it, you know, like you, you were empathic, so your job is done. It's not like that. I mean, you could, um, so the fact is that we all experience imperfect communications. Um, a couple of years ago, my father died really suddenly and mm. a, a lot of people around me responded and they all responded very, very differently. They all meant to be kind and supportive to me, but sometimes the things that they said made me angry. And sometimes the thing they, they said made me hurt more. And sometimes I felt ignored and some, you know, it's like, I just wasn't getting what I wanted. And the thing is, that's just the experience of grief. That wasn't the fault of any one of my friends who all love me. That's the experience of grief. And so, um, so my, my analogy is that it's, it's very much like a game of catch where my job is to catch this ball. But if the pitcher throws it way over there, Am I going to stand there and tell them that they did it wrong? Or do I run for the ball? Just run for the ball. Go get it. You know. And this is like when someone gives me an imperfect communication, instead of saying, oh, I'm going to give you feedback on this communication because you didn't do this and you didn't do this and you should have said this or you should have said that. Just assume that they intend well, assume that they mean well, and meet them halfway. There is a time to give the pitcher feedback, but it's after the game, right? Not during the game. During the game, you run for the ball. After the game, you can say, hey, listen, here's what happened. And we can talk about how to get better at this. But I just think like this kind of how do I respond to people who are suffering? There is no answer that works for everyone. There's no answer that works all the time. But I think what's more helpful is to say, how can I, how can I do a better job re receiving imperfect love, imperfect mm -hmm. empathy, imperfect communication, and um, another, another uh, teaching that I like very much that comes from Buddhism is that um, if you can't cover the earth in leather, then wear shoes, right? <laughs> I, can't, yeah, yeah. I can't make a rule that works for everything, but I can put my own shoes on. And I can say, look, people are going to come at me with, they're going to say words that feel sideways or hurt me a little bit. I can do the work of assuming the best and knowing myself, taking care of myself, making boundaries, doing whatever it is I need to do to take care of me. Because we can't, mm. we can't make rules and expect everyone to know them. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say there's something like self empathy? Yeah. Yeah, I used to not think so. My, my thinking on this uh -huh. has changed in the last couple of years. Because I was like, how can you have empathy? Empathy is about taking your perspective out of out of your own perspective and going into someone else's and how could you do that with yourself yeah but when i started to understand more deeply that within myself i have many many points of view then i know that i can practice this with myself because i don't have only one perspective you know like there are parts of me that have different perspectives. You know, there's a, there's a wounded, there's a wounded part of me that feels one way. There's a really strong, hyper performing part of me that feels another way. And there's, you know, a distant one that feels this way. And the, you know, and so having empathy for myself means trying on all of those different points of view and having dialogue with all those parts of myself. And that's, um, that's my self-knowledge work. That's the self-witnessing part how has like self empathy helped you if at all with the cb cpdsd you know the things that you went through has it in some way helped you yeah it's yeah it's everything it's so look i was for years absolutely crippled by um depression and anxiety and 
self-loathing and shame and all of these like really, really heavy, dark experiences, emotional experiences that caused me to do all kinds of self-destructive behaviors. And, and I wasn't able to, I was doing therapy. I was doing all kinds of things to try to get through it, but I was still encountering it. And I was, but every time I was meeting that part of myself with anger and shame and resistance and rejection, because I was saying, no, I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to hate myself. And so I would say no to that. No, 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 no. And, and I understand why a lot of people do this because, you know, a lot of us have been taught to silence your inner critic or silence the shame voices. When I learned that all of those voices, all of those parts of myself, all of those feelings, they were not external invaders. They are me. They're part of me. And instead of saying, um, no, I don't want you here. Get out of here. I said, hey, it seems like you're upset. What do you need from me? And then eventually, hey, it seems like you're upset. I need to tell you what I need from you. <laughs> like I need you to give me a break or, you know, to give them love, to give them compassion, to give them gratitude, to give them boundaries. Now we're like a harmonious team, you know, mm, yeah. and it's not that, yeah. it's not that I don't have shame anymore. It's not that I don't have that inner critic. It's that we are friends and I can learn from her and I can, I can ask her for a break sometimes, or I can listen to, oh yeah, you're right. I did make a mistake or, you know, whatever it is, but we're not, we're not fighting with each other. And what that means is that I am far less self-destructive and I have tools to manage my inner world so that I don't get into states of desperation. Because it used to be that my emotional life was so intense and painful that I would come to moments where I felt I couldn't bear it anymore. And this was, you know, this was a moment of desperation where I felt like I even needed intervention or I need someone to help me because I think I'm, I think I'm falling apart or losing my mind. I don't have that anymore. I still have all those feelings. But now when I, before I get to this, I'm talking to them, I'm dialoguing with them. I'm letting them have a moment of anger. I'm letting them have a moment of sadness. I'm also, you know, we're all in this together. And so it has absolutely transformed the way that I move through the world because I'm not fighting with myself. Yeah. You're being a team player with yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Karen. Thank you so much for doing this interview, for being vulnerable, for, you know, the tools and, and the insights that you shared here in this interview and for doing the work that you're doing, because it's true. There should be more people doing these trainings on empathy. There is one final end question that I have for you that I like to ask all my guests. But before I ask that question, Karen, what is the best place for listeners to check out you uh, or your and your work and to connect with you? Um, sure. Well, othersunlimited.com is where you can find out more about my work as an empathy trainer um, and an ethnographer and um, where you can connect. There are places to connect with me there. And of course, you know, I'd love for you to share the, the TEDx talk that I gave, um, which I think Will do. explains what I consider to be the most valuable thing that I have to offer is just um, sharing with people the experience of unconditional welcome um, for the self and others, which has helped me so much. Uh, all those things can be uh, found in the show notes. Mm -hmm. The last question that I have for you, Karen, and uh, you can take your time with this. Uh, it can be very short or, well, you can make it as long as you want. From everything that you have seen, experienced, lived and learned in your life, what is the one thing you know to be true? That this isn't all there is. I think that what I know to be true is that everything in this world is, um, you know, it's a, it's just one part of it. It's just one tiny part but that are, there is much more and we can contact that much more when we get in there. That's beautiful. 
Karen, thank you so much for doing this interview. You're welcome. And that's it for this episode, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this interview with empathy trainer Karen Fates and that you learned something new about the importance of empathy and how to practice it in your life. Remember, empathy is not just a feeling, it's a skill that can be developed and nurtured. Now, if you want to practice empathy even more, then check out the resources Karen mentioned, which can be found in the show notes of this episode. Simply go to the description of this episode to find them. There, you can also find a link to Karen's TEDx talk, how to talk to the worst parts of yourself, her website, Others Unlimited, and ways to connect with her. With that, thank you for tuning in and spending this time with me and Karen. I hope to welcome you again soon on another episode, another journey here on the IPS podcast. This is your host, Yelis Fass, signing off.